Um, she's member of the management board at the Institute of Production Science of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. She heads the production systems division dealing with the topics of global production strategies, production system planning, and quality assurance. In 2009, she received the Heinz Meyer Leibniz Award of the German Research Foundation and was awarded in 2016 with the Federal Cross of Merit on Ribbon. She is an active member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the German Academy of Engineering Sciences, ACATEC, and the National Platform Industry 4.0, as well as the Steering Committee of the Alliance Industry 4.0 Baden-Württemberg. In numerous basis, basic sorry, and collaborative projects, uh, Professor Lanza deals with the development of analytical methods for the identification and improvement of given weak points of a production system. Let me add the fact that she is also involved as the chair of the STCO of CRP. And this is my personal pleasure to let the floor to Professor Lanza for our keynote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. It's a honor for me to be here within your wonderful conference, be here in wonderful Nantes, here in this uh, room. I have experience with that room, and I realized my French is so horrible that I even can't read the, the laptop uh, figures. But I think we will manage that, and I have wonderful help. So. I heard today a lot about modeling, optimization. We deal all with production systems, production or manufacturing. And what I would like to talk now is about the digital twin. And I heard a lot about digital twin as well. So maybe for few of you, nothing new. I would like to give you a, my insight what I think digital twin can help us because as Industry 4.0, as we deal with that um, yeah, buzzword, but all with that um, really grateful tools we developed, and uh, with that opinion, what that means, Industry 4.0 and Digital Twin is also a, within that area. I would say everything is a tool for something, and uh, this for something, that's for me today changeable, changeable production. And I would like to start here with that um, slide. It looks a little bit, it should look a, bit, a, little, a little bit like the Big Bang Theory. I'm a really fan of it, it but it's not now at, at, at time. Um, it's the real time here and only the last few years and I mean, yes, we spoke about uncertainty even 10 years ago, but I think you agree with me, at the moment we have really uncertain times, especially really big issues here in, uh, in Europe. And coming back to production, that's only one little piece of that big world here. But in production, we have issues at the moment. I just came back from a telephone conference, a lot of increase in material price, unavailability of materials. So as a production guy at the moment, you don't know where you should be and how to ha handle that. And that's not only since yesterday, it's now since two years, pandemic, figures goes down high, now we could sell, then we can't sell. It's a really huge uncertainty, and you know we call that VUCA, since many years VUCA, and here I don't want to go more in that, but when we talk about VUCA, I don't have any other idea than the tool, digitalization, and digitalization in production, I call Industry 4.0. Why? We have a really 
good advantage in terms of we have available sensors. I mean, when I saw that 20 years ago, we were argumenting a lot with the industry, are we allowed to put a sensor in a machine tool? Ah, oh, the sensor is expensive and the sensor is not 100% available all the time, so I have downtime because of the sensor. Nowadays, I don't hear, hear that argumentation anymore. We, we, even the, con the most conservative machine tool builder, he has a lot of more sensors in the machine. We have the data and um, we start to get used, using that data. So we have the data availab available, not always. It's not only about the sensors, it's a lot about IT hardware, software, IoT we call it, and I think that we have a lot of experts here with, uh, with us. Yes, and especially in this conference, I hear a lot about algorithm uh, tools, again, how to analyze this data. So we have a lot of that, and we even can connect that but still we are having more or less pilots. Sometimes companies, plants who are dealing quite good, but the big picture is not closed. And that has to do with yeah, interoperability. interoperability. Faro, he can do it better in the next session. Um, it has to do with connection standards, with the whole data, data pipeline, everything, and it's much more than the digital twin, but I think the digital twin can be one of this big connector between all this available, uh, these chances we have with that. So what is the digital twin for me? I learned um, there are a lot of definition outside. I took the one from Rainer Stark with Insub, and uh, all others, uh, it's not from him, it's from, um, uh, it's the basic from, uh, from f uh, other peoples, but it's more this, this view on data process flow, let's say, starting with a digital master. Some call it digital model. The master in the planning phase, and then with the digital shadow, can I instantiate or have all my my individual products, for example, with the specific data. And then when I can connect that digital shadow with the digital master in real time, has to be always real time, we can discuss. But when I have this connection, the best thing in both ways, then I talk about the digital twin. And the digital twin, clear in our industry, and you see that with the picture, I'm coming a lot from discrete production, automotive, I'm coming from the south of Germany, everything is automotive, but also machine tool industry, aeronautic and stuff like that. We talk a lot about the product digital twin. And as I'm a production guy, I'm a little bit jealous because I think the product digital twin is uh, further, is um, not 100%, not uh, but uh, we have a lot of good tools. And we are talking a lot about virtual production, digital factory, stuff like that. And I think we just in the, let's say, in the research, in the development of the digital twin, of the production twin. And I show here only as an icon this simulation I think that could be a really big puzzle piece of the digital twin of the production system. But it's my big understanding that the connection is really small between if we have both the digital twin of the production system, we can also learn much more about the digital twin of the product and vice versa. So we can increase our features or decrease our resources we need to produce our products. So um, I would like to focus on a few specific parts of this digital twin. Um, on the one hand, this real-time capability enables because I can have ad hoc updating of my digital twin of the product and the production system. 
And if I have the supply or the connection to, to really quality data, and in the past years I did my PhD in quality management, I think that's a really good advantage to in increase quality by having a digital twin. So having really high quality data, not only from a scrap rate in production, but also from the product functionality, we can then improve, improve, optimize as you do that with your methods. And therefore, it, the digital twin, especially in the production system, is the perfect basis or start really to improve. Last week, I visited the SERP uh, conference, CUT, it's computer added tolerancing, all about quality tolerance in product development and production people there. And I learned from Christina Wormfjord, she explains the term digital twin quite good, that it's invented from Greaves and Vickers already in 2003. I mean, we all know that digital twin is a new word and before we have similars, but this digital twin as we use it or I use it today has its birth that year. But the really in, uh, interesting thing for me is that then 15 years nothing happens or let's say 10 years, 15 years nearly nothing happens. And in the last years you see we are all talking about that. Why is it like that? Again, for me, it's this, this availability of data, all these four issues I said before, we're coming, we are in the area of digitalization, our industry, call it however you want. And we have now the data, we can learn with the data, we can use our algorithms and we have to connect it and therefore we need this digital twin. And the second sentence, also from the founders from Grievous and Vigus, I like it very much because the vision of the digital twin in that part is at its optimum, any information that could be obtained from inspection, that was a quality guy, but you could maybe also take real production design department, so obtained from inspection, a physical manufacturing product can be obtained from its digital twin. So the digital twin can, be, have, can have every information I could gather from the real world. And I just said once, maybe it could be even more, it could be a DNA, maybe with our algorithm and with our data we could even understand more than we can do in the real world. Vision, but we need a vision. So in the following I would like to show uh, pieces. I mean I said okay that's the big picture for us but uh, what do we have and what, where are we at the moment with digital masters? The digital master let's say in the planning phase of our production, we are quite good, for example, with um, simulation, in that terms it's discrete event simulation. We can use it as a digital master for production system, where we can model all the important events, we have to know it, clear, um, and we can set it quite good and forecast how the behavior of our production system is. Still, we have a lot of improvement in this commercial and also research the, uh, DES simulation tools, but still we know we need experts to set up these models and still we know it's not that easy to set up a really valid model. I mean, I realized the last 20 years it's getting much, much easier to set up, let's say, an 80 or 85, 90% valid system. But then the last 5%, I mean, if you're in the first rough planning phase, it's enough. But then if you want to go in the fine tuning of your system, it's getting hard. So I think we need here models, methods, which helps us 
to change easily. Because, as I mentioned in the beginning, the changeability, the system who can adapt to all this VUCA world, that's what we need. And therefore, I would like to go a little bit in theory what we understand when we talk about VUCA, Agile. For me, it's not it's, it's all nice concepts, but clearly, clearly understood. I only understood flexibility and changeability. Agile is even more, we call a lot of our system Agile because we think it should be even more than flexible and changeable. I would like to explain here what we understand about flex, uh, under flexibility and changeability. You need maybe know this old picture, but still valid. When industry is talking about flexibility, normally they mean more, but flexibility is always, you paid for it already. So your machines are able to produce five or 10 variants. You installed all tools in it. It can produce 100,000 pieces and even 120,000 pieces. But if you want to produce 200,000 pieces, you have to install another machine or enhance your machine or scale up or bring up new tools. If there is coming the 14th, 15th variants, you have to change your system. And that's what we understand changeability. And I mean, if it's going up, it's quite nice. We like that and uh, we, we can manage that. Um, what we not like that much is that, let's say going back, at the moment you saw this example with the diesel injector. Maybe you saw it, what it was uh, in the picture before. Yes, there are within Bosch system at least 21 production lines for one of these types. We don't need that anymore. Not yet and tomorrow for sure not. So how we, can we go down and be still efficient? So here that's changeability that I think about, but I don't have to install that everything. And to be prepared for change, for this reaction, that's called changeability. And we talk here a lot about this change enablers like university, modularity, that's a big picture or big issue within machine and system level. Scalability, I gave the example, compatibility and mobility. And you see an example of our learning factories, typical yeah, use case we have in our research um, research la uh, laboratories, it works quite good here. But in real system, we know the challenges. We learned in the last decades a lot about changeable assembly system, but when we go into body and white in car industry or me mecha even mechanical engineer area, body and white or something like that, we are far ahead from changeable systems. So, but we need that and therefore we need tools which enables us to really adapt to this change. And here one example, what I think it's a really huge enabler in methods wise, it's ontology based simulation. If we could model our systems, not by modeling every time and a new with our with our systems and, and do it, but do it on an ontology based, maybe model based system engineering, but ontology based and have here then the flexibility if we really can manage to have a simulation on basic of that, then it's e much, much easier to have then a simulation model changing having much more scenarios, even in the planning phase and afterwards as well. So we clear, I mean, the vision would be directly from the realization, from the real sensor data, having an ontology and then a simulation model. But here is we are still on a planning phase. So modeling with an ontology and getting a simulation directly. And you see here examples. Uh, also from you, uh, I have seen such approaches. I would like to give one use case where it's really necessary. 
I talked a lot about efficiency, so that's the biggest target we still have, but we know that this sustainability, it's getting more and more important. And yes, companies are in the face of dealing with CO2 neutrality and stuff like that, but still that's linear resource efficiency. Using less energy, it's good for the pocket money and good for the, uh, for the environment. But when we think about having a big step, then I think circular economy, we have to really think about circular economy in all of our fields. And one part could be to having remanufacturing, not only in a small niche, what you see here in the picture, that works since decades, but it's only 5%, less than 5% of the aftermarket within automotive. 11 within aeronautic, I think 1.1 in the machine tool industry, I don't know the figures exactly, but it's really a small amount of remanufacturing part and it only works if it's cheaper than the new one because you use it as a spare part. But if we could manage that to bring our cores, how they call them, the old product, really in a second life. I mean, I think we have to do it for recycling in the next years, but recycling means going back to the raw material. Um, remanufacturing would be on a higher value, it would be much better, so, but still. Um, all circular manufacturing, when we look into that processes, we see that we have a lot of uncertainty because we don't know what kind of um, product um, identity is coming back. I have a lot of generation coming back, about many years, a uh, lot of variants, even I don't know if it's my product or product of my competitor. And the big issue is that uncertain product condition. So I have really to inspect it. Um, is it scrap? Can I reuse it? What do I do with that? So, um, and the industry is a lot of challenging, do I have some products and which one are coming back and which one are not? That's a huge supply chain issue and uh, you are experts in that, uh, a lot of you are experts in that as well. So when we talk about such production systems, yes, we talk about a lot of uh, manual work in low cost countries. Ukraine, for example. We talk about small volume, then small and volume and high value, then we even talk about France, Germany and stuff like that. What we need is more automated processes to come up really with high volume. And we have a huge of challenge within that process. We try to model and even set up such a I call it now HI production system, but because I don't know how it looks really, but I know it has to be much more than changeable. And here are a few of these, let's say, characteristics here. On the one hand, as I mentioned, the products are coming back and they look really like that in a box, not nice, not rusty, dirty, um, even you can't identify what it is. So you have a lot of uncertain types and quantities of used products and you have now a lot of inspection. And here all our sensors helps, our learning sensors, because what is rust, is that rust okay, what, what kind of damage is okay, which not, and stuff like that. And then depending on that, let's say, behavior in this, um, this, this situation of the product, then I have to choose the sequence. So it's not a deterministic sequence of my production steps. It could even be that I have 15 steps of only three because then I decided I throw it away, it's scrap and goes to recycling or something like that. So it's really stochastic in, in a high, high um, manner, manner of stochastic, I would say. Then, yes, it depends then how long do I, do I take. So the, the stochastic in the operation times, in the routings, in the uh, regeneration rates, 
that's all increasing the complexity in the system. So what we use here is, is this, let's say, mm, matrix production, where we have a higher freedom and can choose. Um, maybe you need, name it more group manufacturing systems or like, uh, things like that. But what we try to come up in this system is to have high flexibility. And people still have this high flexibility, but we want to bring it into our, our systems. And therefore we need, for example, these AGVs and a lot of stations with capabilities, they are grown up, so, or they are growing, enhancing. So for example, if the capacity is not enough, we should be able to set up a new station or a new machine very quickly or bring the machine to another place where I need it at the moment. So here I would say this example shows a re really nice area where we need this high agile production, but still we could talk about other industry. We don't have this stable circumstance like we had in the past. So here I said this complexity I have shown needs that kind of tools I, uh, I showed before. So we need here, I think, digital master, digital twins, but I will start with the digital master to set up the systems and then to foresee what happens next week, what can I do. We try to set that up. You see here again these um, discrete event simulations. We try to have cap capacity forecasting, even material requirement forecasting, uh, more or less in a manual system or in a, in a concept system. What we try to set up is the reality in the terms that we want to learn from human beings and transfer it to robots. Because as I mentioned, I'm really convinced that we have to bring this production to high cost countries. That we can close the loop directly and that we can bring this used product into a new life cycle, but not as an old generation, as a new product generation with new features to really get an eternal uh, um, and, and, and product which comes um, has the newest feature. So we set up such learning, let's say, um, learning robots, but also automated stations with typical robots, but also manual station and a lot of uh, sensors for inspection in, in the beginning, but also iterating after each step. And if you look here at one of the stations where we want to learn from the human being, learning how he is doing this disassembly, because he can tackle with all this complexity if the damage is high, bigger than before and the force for the screw is not defined and stuff like that. We try to learn here all single steps, let's say, uh, and transfer it to robots, first human robots and then industrial robots, and if you look at that, I mean, that's research, that's not industry at the moment, but clear, they are only a stable master, which I then manually, even with the ontology, uh, if I change that manually, that doesn't help me, because I really need the real figures from the real lab in that terms, but also in industry from the real world. And here I would like to go, go over, let's say, to this digital shadow. Digital shadow, for me, the main point is that I really connect, let's say, the data sources, the information systems uh, from the reality to a digital world and then use that in a digital master and therefore we call it then twin. But what can we do when we only look here again at the detail level of a discrete event simulation? I think we are quite good in having real data according to parameterization of data already. So what do I mean? We take the direct data out of the 
MES system out of the sensors, see the fluctuation in the process time and put that directly in a simulation. That's possible, but in many cases it's really um, a lot of effort to doing that. But what it's pretty hard if we talk about this changeable system, what I showed before, if I really set up a new station, bring in new people in the system, how can I do that automatically or how could that be realized automatically within my model that I can then really um, use it and simulate again. And also logic. What is when I change my heuristic, first in, first out, or my production schedule is not only changing in types and volume, but also in the logic, in, as I showed in this example, uh, that my routing is changing. How can I bring these changes to my system, in my system, and I can do it not always manually, but automatically? So that would be the vision for me for the digital shadow. So connecting these heterogeneous data sources and the digital shadow with a standard adapter, let's say it like that, the interoperability can be guaranteed. So the vision. We have one um, model or one, let's say, concept where we say, okay, we start with a typical simulation model, um, uh, analyze is it valid, uh, decide adjustments, and then let's say that's the digital master, and then go in this digital shadow where I realize because I have the connection to the real data, I have algorithms where I can realize that the logic has changed. I identify which logic has changed if somebody outside of my digital twin has uh, changed it, if my structure has changed, and then I can automatically adjust my digital master, and if that would work, then I would call it digital twin already. So what you see here is a typical discrete simulation model, discrete event simulation model. But I, what I want to show here a lot of people inside and when I have manual work, you know that, then it's, I can talk, model with average time, but in that case, it's an industrial case of these injectors from a German automotive supplier. We have the real data and then we can really model it with the real data and put it, let's say, in the data sources. And therefore, then you can let's say even do some specific optimization if you can here have less people, more people, that's for clear typical, let's say, digital master optimization tools. The issue is you can't see here if it's really a digital twin. I mean, what would you do? A model, then validate it, for example, with here, show if it's real or not. But what I would like to show with this example is that we are really good with the real time, in real time with the real data. And therefore, I think such kind of model then can use to do the other steps automatically. And concept-wise it works, but at the moment we are still struggling with that logic. But we need then a lot of metrics, how we can then assess this change in the reality and bring it in the digital twin, I would call it digital twin already. So, so far our work to digital twin, what is the vision? Um, the vision is that daydreaming, not only factory, we have this keynote in the summer in, within SERP, daydreaming factory, we call it daydreaming engine, because still what I showed is a, a part, a digital twin from a production system. Others are then digital twin from the product, or you want to optimize a supply chain. I think what we clearly need for these digital twins are real data. If the real data in a data lake, again, that's an example, here it's in a data lake, and if we now connect these models to each other and have the bidirectional connection, then we call it daydreaming engine, 
And then we could have clear interfaces between uh, these uh, models and have then interaction. So what makes, what effects makes a change in the supply chain towards really the quality trap grade, for example, in one machine. So I think that connecting models are a big step towards this changeability, what I think we need. So let's conclude. The digital twin, I really think, is a huge opportunity for us to connect a lot of our models algorithm. But what we need is much more work or future work in research that we can automate model that we ha can multiple, have multiple models connected to each other, that we can faster deployment and clear still we need a lot of tools in decision support, not only on the plant levels, but also on the supplier, uh, supply chain level. So thank you very much. And now I'm more than happy to uh, answer your questions.